Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our third um, webcast, and this time tonight with Polly Hammond, who uh, you'll see on the screen, my partner in crime. We're talking about sommeliers and what's happening to uh, the world of the uh, entree. We have Ronan Saban um, from 67 Pall Mall, the heart of uh, the wine world in London, and Ronan's background has been with Gordon Ramsay for many years, but with, before that with um, other luminaries of, of the British and, and other international food uh, restaurant world. And we have James Tidwell, um, who is the co-founder of the Texom Conference, which I'm sure you'll talk about a bit more in a second, um, but also the Texom International Wine Awards, which I was uh, honored to be invited to uh, judge at. And I think we are going to have Elaine Chicken Brown. We're not going to have Elaine tonight. Have we lost her. Okay, so yeah. it's just effectively the three of us and our audience. I think we've got Joe Fatterini coming across. And we might week. have one more person joining um, us. But Joe Fatterini is going to be relevant to this because he's of the wine show, um, the television the online and television show but also he's just told us that he's actually busy writing a book about sommeliers so um and he's been working with uh Barry Brothers and Rudd and he knows the sommelier world very well so hopefully he's going to be um appearing as well any any minute so um can I kick off with with you James because you you're obviously at the heart of a pretty big um fraternity of of sommeliers of psalms in the states and obviously you've got some places that are on lockdown and others that aren't. What, what are you hearing from? Well, I think like the rest of the hospitality industry around the world, hard hit, uh, that varies. I think we're all headed towards the same position if uh, things don't change soon. But we've heard everything from laid off, uh, no work to furloughed, uh, which allows employers to pay insurance, which of course is critical in a time like this, uh, to currently employed, but don't know how long that will last. Uh, and then of course, lots of creativity in terms of trying to make things work for restaurants. Uh, here in Texas, where I'm based, uh, restaurants are now allowed to do takeaway at curbside and sell alcohol to go, which was previously not always the case, uh, depending on type of liquor license. So a lot of restaurants are getting creative with that uh, and other efforts, but uh, a lot of bleak scenarios. And uh, at the moment, what we're hearing is a big push to lobby the government uh, to help with rescue if they're rescuing other industries to look at the hospitality industry as well. Um, and but I mean, let's just talk about because sommeliers as a, as a group. Uh, one of the things that interests me is that part of what they do is serving wine, but there's also a lot of stuff they do in terms of educating themselves, the interaction between them. Um, how is that? How, how's that working? Well, what we're seeing in terms of education uh, amongst the sommeliers themselves is a, a lot of online wine tasting, uh, a lot of sharing <laughs> of notes and. Uh, very much like the rest of the world uh, in this age of social distancing, uh, time of social distancing, we're seeing a lot of sommeliers uh, do online and group uh, either tastings and or theory uh, service scenario questions, things like that. So there is still education going on, but it's in a different form. Truthfully, though, with the way the world was working already in terms of social media and the connectivity, a lot of sommeliers were already doing that. So it's just being carried out even more now. Uh, in terms of um, what we do in restaurants though, uh, there have been recommendations of posting food and wine pairings on your, your social media pages so that uh, consumers can look there for their food and wine pairings because there is still takeaway curbside in most places and many of the restaurants are able to sell to go. And so you can actually get food and wine still from a restaurant, just not in a traditional service setting. So a lot of your, a lot of your community are actually, actually are working in the restaurants. Uh, they're actually turning up and, and putting bottles of wine alongside food parcels to go. 
It depends. Uh, we have people who are uh, management and typically management is being kept on in some form to keep the restaurant going so that there's something for us to go back to, but uh, not in all cases. In many cases, people have been laid off or furloughed. And in those, in those cases, it's, it's a really devastating time for everyone. Uh, there's no way of knowing what's going to happen next. Ronan, um, are you in touch with many people in the UK? Obviously, we're not, for anyone who's watching from outside the UK, we're not yet uh, under lockdown. I think most people imagine that it's going to happen sooner rather, rather than later. But are you, are you hearing things from, because restaurants, we're, we're told not to go to restaurants. Um, restaurants have closed. We're, we're locked down in some ways, but we're, we, we've only just locked down restaurants, if you like. What are you hearing? Yeah, I mean, we had a, we had a, a scary few days where um, basically restaurant chains were closing. Three days empty, no customers. The government saying, uh, don't go to restaurants, but then they weren't telling restaurants to close. Um, and then we had a few, four, four or five days, a lot of friends of mine that were very scared, uh, having to lay off staff. Um, but then, you know, the government did step in with this great initiative where they're gonna pay up to 80% of everyone's salary. Um, for, for, for all sorts of industries, not just hospitality. But I think that that was a massive relief to a lot of people um, who really thought that they'd just be out of, out of work and they, they, at least they're going to get 80% of their salary from now on. So the government's put a lot of money into that. So I think, you know, hats off to them. I'm not a great Boris fan, but hats off to what he's done with that initiative. And I mean, obviously a lot of restaurants have still got, I mean, there are questions of, of how solid uh, a lot of businesses were before this it's not even always easy for a restaurant and presumably there are going to be questions of, of how long restaurants can survive with or without government help uh, because it's never, going to, it's never going to replace what they would have been making yeah well i mean you know we i think the restaurant industry went through that another before that before this the world went crazy with this coronavirus you know we went through the madness of brexit for three years not knowing what was going to happen there and then we went through this government, um, you know, you won't be allowed a visa unless you're being paid over 25,000 and most people are considered to be low skilled workers, which, you know, those low skilled workers working in hospitals and stocking supermarket shelves now are pretty important, I think. Um, but yeah, so we, there's a lot of things that have been happening which are gonna have a knock on effect in the catering industry, I think. I don't think it's gonna be a good time for the UK catering industry in, in general. Um, I think that what the government wants to do is they want to you know, encourage employers to train people from scratch. But part of the, you know, part of the sommelier kind of um, ethos um, really isn't in the British kind of mentality. You know, the whole catering thing maybe isn't really in the British mentality. So I think to take, you know, and, I, and I've been a British English sommelier, you know, all my life, obviously, um, and I've seen very few. There's not a lot of people from the UK that want to get involved in this industry. I think it's all kind of looked down on still, you know, has been for a long time. Joe, you've been, Joe Fatterini, I, I introduced you earlier. You, you've been talking to sommeliers in the last few days, uh, maybe a bit longer in terms of the book you're writing. What, what are you hearing from, are you just talking in the UK or internationally? And what are you hearing? In, internationally. And it's been, um, it's been sobering, I guess, to talk to sommeliers around the world, um, particularly, I think, in the United States, where lots of people have been furloughed. Um, I spoke to a sommelier in, in Berlin, and it, it was really tough because she said, look, can you phone me up um, at this particular time? And I rang up and I said, why? And she said, oh, this is the last call I'm going to make before I lock the door. And her and her husband were, were locking the door and, and walking away, and they didn't know when they were going to go back in. Um, fortunately so far, and I'm sure there'll be some different tales, mostly people have found it very useful because it gives them something to do and they're really enjoying, I mean, I guess, the, just the chance for an hour to go and talk about their lives and feel that they're, they're being kind of useful. I mean, you know, I don't want to sound in any way glib, it has provided an opportunity for the first time. You know, there's an awful lot of sommeliers who are really keen to go and tell me, you know, their story. And they've got lots of time to go and tell me their stories. And, you know, you're not trying to catch people between service and so on. So I'm hoping that we can take a small positive out of a, out of a tough, tough circumstance. Everybody uh, who's got in touch has been somebody who's sitting at home twiddling their thumbs. You know, they're, um, they're all on the whole being looked after to some degree by their, their employers and employers at the moment are trying to do the, do the best for them. 
Um, but no, it, it has been a, a tough time. You know, for me as a writer, it's, it sounds awful, but you know, there, there has been that element where people have, they're being quite reflective. They're keen to go and talk about their careers up to now. I'm going to give my email address up and, and you know, on the, the group chat and anybody feel free to, to get in touch and I'll, I'll occupy you for an hour, um, you know, on, on, online. But um, there have been some really interesting stories already. It's been great. Um, uh, we've actually got a number of, of, of people actually watching this which is, um, and producers as well, who I think quite a number of those uh, who are chipping in. Um, just as an aside, um, just heard for a note, and you may have read this in the chat, and said, Lorenzo Visconti, a friend from Italy, has just pointed out that in Italy has been officially postponed to 2021, which is not, um, I think, a big surprise for many of us, but it's a, it's a sad moment because I think um, I certainly, it's one of my favorite events of the year. Um, just to go back to that, um, James, in terms of what Joe's talking about, are you aware of, of sommeliers the ones who are actually working from home, coming up with, with projects of doing something different. Are we going to, are we going to see something maybe grow out of this situation um, in terms of sommeliers creating something new? I, I think so. I don't know what that is yet. And I hate to speculate, but I was talking to some people this morning who had been furloughed and said, well, we're working out what we want to do next uh, as a team to, figure out something new and different. Uh, I think it's made all of us realize how tenuous the jobs can be in the restaurant industry, uh, especially, you know, when you're not, not directly showing a contribution to the bottom line always. Uh, it's sometimes hard to, to show that contribution that a sommelier makes to the bottom line as a direct line. And yet sommeliers who are in restaurants doing what hopefully all of us are, do in restaurants. Uh, we're not just serving wine. We're bussing tables. Look at Bobby Stuckey. And that's what he's known for. He's one of the great master sommeliers. And yet he's bussing tables every night at his restaurant. You're hosting the door. You're expediting on the kitchen line. You, you can play any role in a restaurant. I know Ronan has done, I think, all of those roles himself. We've talked about this on occasion. And so sommeliers are in many ways, much more versatile and, and uh, beneficial than just the direct contribution of wine sales to the bottom line. And so I'm hoping that one of the things that comes out of this is that restaurants do see the need for sommeliers as something other than just serving wine. That's not all we do. That is our job. That is our main focus. But we should be able to do almost anything in a restaurant in terms of service. Um, there are many of us actually who've gone to culinary school and could probably jump behind the line and cook a meal or two if we needed to. I think there's something that, that I would chip in and say that in, in my lifetime, I've seen uh, certainly in the UK and US sommeliers uh, change their, I think, climb the ladder of, of, of importance and, and visibility enormously. I think uh, in France, there always was Certainly, in the great restaurants, there was there was a, a role for uh, the the top sommeliers. They were they were respected to an extent. Um, Japan, uh, I think, because the Maison Sommelier du Monde, when a Japanese um, Takashi Senior won that, uh, I think that made him a star. And we had the the, 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 the manga comics and so on. But what I what struck me, and I judged at the Maison Sommelier du Monde competition uh, last year. Why are sommeliers as important as they are? To me, one of the things that's fascinating is the collegiate nature of what yes. you guys do. And the fact that uh, when something um, becomes, if, if a sommelier in London, if, if Ronan, you find something in London and you begin to talk about it, James will hear about it in Dallas and someone will hear about it certainly in New York. That will bounce possibly to, to Tokyo and to everywhere else in a way that possibly doesn't happen with the, the writers. I'm not sure that the, the, the critics read each other and take as much notice of what they, 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 they say as sommeliers do. And I've got my own thoughts as to why this is, and I'm going to keep quiet on them for a second, but I'd be interested to know your thoughts on that, Ronan. Yeah, well, I think um, sommeliers, you know, they, they, you know, part of our trade is very much customer facing. 
And it's very much, you know, being able to tell stories, you know, be able to tell a tale about something and tell something interesting about a wine. Um, and, you know, and if you do find something interesting or something a bit rare or something which has a good story behind it, I think that story needs telling as much to your customers as to your colleagues. So I think that that's, you know, the Instagram kind of nation. Probably if you looked at something like Clos Rougeard, I used to buy Clos Rougeard for about £12 a bottle. And now it's about 120 pounds a bottle. And that's just because it exploded on social media and it went crazy on Instagram and it's a great wine. Um, so I think that, you know, that sharing of information and knowledge and, you know, recommendations for things, I think is just kind of, is just kind of what we do. You know, we participate in a lot of um, uh, tastings and we go on a lot of trips together and things like that. And I think that the sommelier's role for me is partly kind of sharing knowledge and sharing kind of passion. And all of that is done very, very, you know, it's, it's a free flow of ideas and a free flow of information, really. Oh, I saw you nodding when I talked about the collegiate thing. Any thoughts on that? At me? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. no, Joe. Joe, you... Oh, you wow. That has, um, has been a, a real theme in the research around the book. And it is, I mean, I think it's collegiate, like Ronan was saying there, where um, there's that sense of, you know, sharing amongst the community of being people going and talking about stuff. There's also kind of professional camaraderie. And in fact, the, 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 the book, um, I won't give too much away, but it opens up uh, with me disappearing at 67 Pall Mall into the, the bowels of the building that the members don't normally go and see. And there's Ronan's team all sitting around eating to manger salads and so on and the first thing that happens is that um terry goes and offers me a biscuit and sort of welcomes me into this little kind of community and as i talk to different songs they they all go and talk about each other and who's given whom a leg up um who gave somebody an amazing piece of advice um there's surprisingly little i'm no i don't know <laughs> the professional songs here may, may disagree there's actually surprisingly little sort of bitchiness and cattiness about stuff there's an awful lot of um monday and sunday night dinner parties where people get together and bring really fabulous bottles and talk about stuff and share their kind of background and often a kind of shared um it's interesting that you're just talking james about the the, the skill sets that are outside there was one person talked to me yesterday and she said anything that came with stemware was their responsibility yeah. to the point that they would arrive at lunchtime and all the breakfast orange juice glasses would be still waiting for them for the sommeliers to clear up and to polish because that belonged to sommeliers that wasn't something that all the other team went and looked after and they sort of bonded over that and cried we've got to go and do all the orange juice glasses from breakfast it seemed completely mad to me but that falls under their sort of responsibility your responsibility yeah. Can I chip yeah. in with, with my theory as to why one of the big differences between Soms and, um, and critics and others, and James, I'd be interested in your thought of this. To me, I think a lot of Soms are looking actually at the next job, and the next job might be in their own country, it might be in another country, it might be as a group sommelier or whatever. And so, uh, and this may be a, 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 a maybe mischievous in saying this, but when I look at some of the Instagram stuff I see from Soms and some of the blogs and so on, there's a certain self-promotional element in that, which is kind of saying, you know, this is me, I'm, I'm positioning myself, not necessarily at that moment, but it is kind of, this is your CV. I've discovered wine from Albania. I've discovered this food and this unusual food and wine match. And when an employer looks to take someone on, that's all relevant to them. But also when other SOMs are looking to employ someone or to, to they know that such and such a restaurant is looking for someone. They say, oh yeah, well, there's, there's John or Jack. Who, are, who might be relevant to you because of this and that. Is that a, is that a, a, a totally off the, the wall or mischievous view on my part, uh, James? Well, first, let me say part of what I appreciate about you, Robert, is your mischievousness. So, um, uh, and and I, don't, I don't think it's off the wall. At the same time, I, I look at it a little bit differently, uh, going back to Joe's comment about collegiality and, and some of Ronan's comments. If you work a restaurant service, you are going to get to a restaurant service scenario at some point where all hell is breaking loose and it may or may not be in your control and you learn to work together as a group and take what control you can of the situation and get through it. And I think that is a bonding experience in a restaurant that critics do not have. 
Yeah. Um, that's not to say it's better or worse. It's just a different experience. And I think bringing it back to what's happening today, that's exactly what you're seeing in the U.S. We don't have 80% of our salaries being paid by the government. You know, that's not happening here. Lots of people are being furloughed and laid off. And what we're seeing is the Solme community, the hospitality community, because I don't think you can really isolate Solmes from the hospitality community as a whole, are really working together just as in these, what you might call practice scenarios of having gone through these, these nightmare services uh, where we're coming together to help feed each other for those who've been laid off, to find resources. Uh, there, are, there are people who are now, instead of being sommeliers, are helping other people, other sommeliers, learn to fill out unemployment forms so they get their benefits. They are helping put boxes together of fresh produce from suppliers that would otherwise go to waste so that they can be sent out to sommeliers families who need assistance, to hospitality members. Uh, you know, I think those types of things are bonding experiences that relate back to that restaurant experience of going through those services where things just aren't going right and you have to work together and you have to help each other out and rely on each other and get through it. And I think as a community, that's what you're seeing right now is really an extension of, of that. Ronan, any of your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd agree. And I, I kind of do think there is that kind of collegiate kind of, a, kind of feeling amongst the Somalia community because a lot of people work, you know, for a short period of time in restaurants and they move around and they want different experiences. They want to work with different people, work with different wine lists, different types of cuisine. So they do move around quite a lot. So they get to meet a lot of people. And wherever you are on that career ladder, there's always people going to be around you that you've kind of either worked with or you've known or you've tasted with or whatever. And, you know, and I think that, you know, the sort of rise of um, people doing a lot of wine exams and things like that, you know, that's a very humbling experience. You know, being standing up in front of your peers and asked to do a blind tasting that you get totally wrong does make you look very stupid. And if you're going to be starting to act like too much of a superstar with a big head, um, you won't stay long in the business, I don't think. So I think that, you know, the action of doing those exams and things like that do make people quite humble. And they do make them kind of quite receiving for hospitality, which is their job. And they do make them kind of like, there's a very strong sense of community and a very strong sense of camaraderie within the profession, I think. You're right. both, both you and James and Roland, you're both master sommeliers and there are today fewer of them than there are masters of wine. And one of the interesting things for me is the difference between, and of course, there are, uh, Basse was one of the, the rare people who'd done both. And James, I think you're doing the MW, you're going through the MW process, so you could follow in his... Well, I don't know about all that. Let's, but, let's uh, pull that to the side. But, right my, <laughs> potentially, <laughs> but my, 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 point here, my point here is that there is a, an interest, well, again, somebody who's done neither of these uh, qualifications, so I have nothing but respect for anyone who's done one, let alone both. One of the differences between the two is that being a, a master of wine is very, very knowledge focused, whereas being a, a master sommelier, selling or, or actually being customer facing um, is intrinsic to the qualification. So you could actually become a master of wine without any skills necessarily in um, selling a bottle of wine in a shop, for example. Uh, that's my understanding of it. Whereas as a master sommelier, if you cannot actually go to a table and satisfy the, 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 the needs of people coming out to have a good time with their dinner, you are not going to be a master sommelier. Is that, is that a fair way of looking at it? Yeah, that's correct. I think so. I mean, we, we have three parts for the exam. It's the theory, it's the tasting, but then it's the practical part. And the practical part really when you get up to the master sommelier level, it's done at a very high level. Um, and people have to have a lot of time working in restaurants to be able to do it. You know, we really kind of think that you, you probably need to be a minimum of between five and 10 years working in restaurants. And that's coming from probably being a waiter, maybe being a barman, maybe moving into a junior sommelier, then moving up to a senior sommelier, and then kind of like a head sommelier before you're attempting to take the master sommelier exam. So it, it, that means a lot of hours on the floor, a lot of um, 
dealing with customers, uh, dealing with problems, uh, you know, thinking on your feet, doing all of that sort of stuff, you know, and it's really important for, for, for our side of the business as master sommeliers. I mean, Joe, you were talking earlier about having done the, some of the MW studies. Um, do you see that? Do you see that being a difference in your in terms of your experience? Completely. And you know what? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is a book to be written about people doing the MW. Um, it would be a very different. You know, I think it'd be a very different book because one of the things that's so attractive about writing a book about Somalia is when I was approached and they said, "Would you, you know, you'd be interested in writing this?" I was a Somali at an incredibly small level a long time ago, but then I've spent much of my career, you know, working with Somalia. So I have a sort of outside in but small experience on the inside what's so fascinating and what's come through all the way through is that it is possible to be a dilettante master of wine and it's an awful phrase but you know it's possible to be a non-wine mw in that sense it cannot be done within the master sommelier you have to be part of the group and I think all the way through, what's fascinating, in one chapter I sort of explore the use of the word sommelier, how it's been applied to non-wine roles, you know, the idea of a butter sommelier, water sommelier, coffee sommelier, that kind of thing. Part of that almost is, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery because people recognise that it is this exclusive craft. The other part is that people have tried to co-opt this title, but you can't really you've got to go and do it you've got to go and walk the floor you've got to go and join the guild in in that way and it is a, a proper guild you know craft guild you you have to do it to be one you can't buy your way in i mean you know like ronan says you've got to be doing it for, I, mean, I would say you know good 10 years um to go and have the deep smarts and the, the very subtle parts of it. I've been very lucky, Ronan's once or twice asked me along, to not not be a judge, but to be part of, you know, when you, you're the sort of guests who are served. And I've rarely seen such a terrifying test of people, you know, in sommelier competitions, um, to to watch people doing it on stage in that way. It's, it's utterly fascinating. It's a real insight into the way people behave. I jump in on this for a minute um, because I am waking up and going to sleep every day with communications from small to medium sized wineries. And of course I live in New Zealand. So a lot of, a lot of my wineries, you know, are Kiwis who don't have a huge export um, market and they are struggling right now because in some of our key centers, our songs, just like you're saying, are, being being laid off being put on furlough the issue for the wineries is that you guys for better or for worse have always represented our gatekeepers to our hospital industry can you talk to us a little bit about how the wineries right now especially in a place where you know new zealand where we're a primary industry how we can leverage our voices and our actions to help you and help the hospo industry in this trying time? I can speak to that in the US. There are several initiatives right now. The National Restaurant Association, uh, if you go to their Facebook page, it was posted about noon yesterday uh, in the US, has an act now button that will take you to a page uh, for an email campaign to the government. I mean, at that point, at this point, that is what would be helpful to the restaurant industry because there is no rescue right now for the restaurant industry, at least uh, as of when we went on live today. And the other one is uh, Bobby Hugel, who's a major player in the bartending industry and the, the bars industry in the US uh, based in Houston has put together uh, a form letter that people in the US or wineries outside of the US who, who do business here could send to representatives and senators uh, in the US to help them understand how important the industry is because you're right, at the moment, many of the people that you would consider to be gatekeepers uh, are trying to figure out how they're going to make it through the next month or two, if not longer. And so it's, it's really that that would help at the moment. And there are various ways to do it, but certainly getting in touch with 
some of the groups that are out there advocating for the industry would be helpful. And what about our communications with the, the restaurant owners and the people who right now are themselves in dire straits and we're trying to be empathetic, but we need to be able to speak to them and let them know how important your role is to our ongoing economics of, of wineries. Yeah. I, I think in any area of the world, that's always important, uh, more so now, but uh, at any time that's important. And certainly reaching out to those contacts that you might have in the restaurant industry would be great in encouraging them to make sure that sommeliers are considered when uh, these various actions are needing to be taken. There are a lot of people right now having to make very, very tough decisions in the U.S. And that goes, uh, and I think that's around the world, but certainly uh, my experience is mostly in the U.S. at the moment. And that's who many of the, those are many of the people I've been talking to. Uh, though I have talked to some friends around the world and see that on social media as well. But the industry here is uh, from top down making tough decisions. I mean, employers are having to make hard decisions about do they cut now and uh, have this horrible, painful process now, but hopefully have something left for people to come back to or do you keep going as you are with the possibility that this extends beyond what we think and there isn't something to come back to? And, and those are terrible decisions. I talked to a GM at a hotel friend of mine in one of the worst affected cities in the U S and she said, you know, it's, it's difficult because you think of your staff as your family. And on the one hand, you don't want to cause them pain by laying them off. On the other hand, the staff doesn't necessarily want to be there either because they're getting exposed potentially and then carrying that home to their families and loved ones. These are all hard decisions that we're trying to make. And I think one of the things that I would advocate for everybody, whether it's your wineries, Polly, um, anybody in the industry is try to be compassionate with each other. We're all doing the best we can. Okay. Okay. So Ronan, I, I have a question for you then, which is, do you see any opportunities coming out of this, either for the Psalms, for restaurant owners? How can we look at this in some sort of positive change for three, six, nine months from now? Well, I do think you're starting to see some interesting things on social media. And I've noticed that there's a lot uh, of chefs doing things like Instagrams that might be a th you know a, a video of them showing how to cook rice or how to chop an onion or something like that and I think that the sommeliers will start moving on to that as well a couple of my sommelier friends are doing things like videos about coffee um, I think people will start doing blind tastings I think for Palmal we're going to start doing a, a kind of a video blog thing of myself and the other sommeliers doing tastings or doing whatever um, writing a few, a few blogs and things like that. I think that, you know, most people that are studying are always playing a bit of a game of catch up. So it'll give people a lot of time to bed down with a few books and do a bit of reading um, and hopefully, you know, do a bit of writing and just come up with sort of inventive ways of how to stay engaged with your customers um, from a distance, which is pretty difficult to do when you're, you know, when you're, you're customer facing, you know, really as a sommelier. So, so I think that, you know, it's, it's very, early now for us in the UK. Um, <clears throat> our restaurants only closed down on Friday. So um, it's quite it's quite soon for us. But I think that, you know, as the as the sort of the weeks drag on as they will do, we'll probably start seeing some really kind of quite innovative and quite imaginative things coming out. And hopefully, you know, hopefully people all know that wine is all about fun and it's enjoyment and not to be taken too seriously. So hopefully there'll be some quite light hearted and some humorous things that come out of it all. We have I Thanks. I've got a question from Joe Morgan. Um, Joe, would you like to actually ask this question um, for your yes, rather than me ask it for you? Um, are you there, Joe? Yeah, yeah Andy. Um, it was a question mainly for Joe or Ronan, just talking about the sommeliers and the roles of the sommeliers in, um, in the UK. I um, was wondering if you guys think that restaurants in the UK are a bit too food focused as in it's always named after the chef and all they talk about is the food and a lot of the time when you go and buy a 
a taster menu, um, the wine is sort of an, an extra add-on rather than something that naturally comes with the meal to put it, tie it all in together. I'm going to defer to Ronan, the uh, wine director at a restaurant entirely based around wine. <laughs> the first instance, perhaps it's more the exception that proves the rule. Well, yeah. I mean, I work, I work with some pretty big name chefs, you know, in my time. And, you know, it was all about them, to be honest. Um, but, you know, the very successful chefs who are very successful restaurateurs know that, you know, when it comes to the bottom line in the business, um, the sommeliers for a very small team of people compared to a big shit team of chefs or a big team of front of house people, a small team of sommeliers can bring in a lot of revenue. Um, as long as they're good sommeliers and they're great with customers and customers trust them, then, you know, they can do an awful lot to improve the business. So I, I'm not really into the sort of the whole concept of celebrity sommeliers. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, that definitely a, a restaurateur not to have enough foresight or a chef restaurateur not to have enough foresight to think that he needs somebody to be managing the wine program, managing the deliveries, managing the things that need to be sent back keeping an eye on the list, keeping an eye on the margins, you know, managing that side of the business, I think is very, very important for a restaurant. And a chef or a restaurateur who doesn't understand that, I don't know if they're going to be in business for a long time. I'd like to, Laura Katana has got a question. Um, I think, Laura, you're in San Francisco at the moment. Laura's on our last uh, session um, last on Friday. Um, Laura, would you like to ask your question rather than me reading it out? Um, well, actually, the question was related to what I've seen a restaurant here, Kefico, do, which is that they post on Instagram a menu for $50, and actually they make it very easy to donate another $50 to give a free meal to somebody, which is optional, and it was very easy to order, get the food, the food was good, it was in a nice bag, um, and I'm just wondering if there's other restaurants around the world who are doing this kind of easy, you know, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, one menu, sort of prefix, uh, and they had a free bottle of wine, <laughs> which was even better for me. Thanks, Lara. Anyone, anyone know of any initiatives? Uh, James, you aware of anything like that? Quite a few. Uh, as to the free bottle of wine, that depends on which state you're in. <laughs> yeah. And how, how the temporary laws have been changed in the state, because in Texas, that would have been, uh, including any bottle of wine in a to-go order from a restaurant would have been illegal uh, for most restaurants until recently. Uh, but there are a number of initiatives. There's an initiative in Houston called Houston Ship Meal that allows people to donate to uh, feed some of the hospitality workers. As far as actual takeout, I've seen restaurants doing survival kits, which actually is not cook food. They send home uh, supplies from their suppliers and it's a menu that you can prepare at home uh, using their ingredients uh, as you would at the restaurant uh, or as you would get at the restaurant. Uh, others are doing uh, pickup with uh, wines on offer, uh, but the, again, that is state to state. So it, it just depends, but there are a lot of initiatives out there right now of, of people selling wine. I know of at least one restaurant uh, who sold quite a bit of wine for being closed because they got on the phone to their regular guest. And because they are in their state currently allowed to sell wine takeaway, started selling allocated bottles out of their cellar to, to make payroll. And so they effectively, um, uh, sold off a lot of their allocated bottles and made enough money to make payroll out of that. So there are a lot of creative initiatives right now. People are just trying to get by. Um, I've got a question here. Is that from Joe to Joe? Um, about no, how much? I was answering an, an addendum to Joe's original question. Okay, sorry, other Joe. Okay, so basically, you're, could you want to make that point in public? It's it's worth. Well, hearing. Be, yes, it, it was. Uh, I was asked the other day to appear on a it was a TV show, and they were looking at um, having a wine element to this. And somebody said, "Well, you know, can't really see why wine is terribly important in restaurants." So I pointed out, I said, "You know, it's about thirty percent of an average restaurant's takings can be in beverage and, and principally wine. Uh, the margins are often very strong, um, and actually, the amount of time and payroll that looks after wine 
can be much smaller than the amount of payroll that's looking after sort of food. And I came up with this quip at the end, I said, you know, it's the food that gets people through the restaurant's doors. It's wine that keeps the doors open. And I think we need to keep striving to make that point that, you know, when it comes to, to businesses trading, sommeliers are disproportionately important in the overall profitability and, and ongoing success of restaurants. Can I clarify a statement I made earlier too, which was about not always being able to draw a direct line to the bottom line with sommeliers. I think that that can be done. I, I think that uh, in the context of my quote, it was actually about the idea of, do you need a sommelier versus anybody else to sell wine? And the fact of the matter is that exactly what Joe is talking about is what, what makes it worthwhile and what Ronan talked about earlier with taking care of the inventory, taking care of the, the wine lists and things like that, where, where I think sommeliers really contribute to that bottom line. And it's not just in sales, but in all the other things they do beyond sales as well. And a lot of it is about customer care, guest care. I think it's a point that people, when, when we all complain, when a lot of us complain about the markup on a bottle of wine, we, we forget how that markup is, is helping the restaurant uh, keep on. I've got Michael Ratcliffe from, I don't, he probably isn't in South Africa because Michael's never, um, wherever, he's, he's always somewhere else from wherever I expect him to be. Um, I'll ask you where you are in a second, Michael, but you've got some news from South Africa. You're, you're based in South Africa. You make Villa Fonte, or you, you, you co-own the Villa Fonte winery. Um, what's your news from South Africa? Well, hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, pretty big news in South Africa. Uh, about 30 minutes ago, the president um, uh, addressed the nation and announced a 21-day lockdown of every single business in the entire country. So that means that effective midnight tomorrow night, every restaurant, well, every non-essential business will have to lock down and close their doors for, for 21 days. So it's the right thing to do, but... Uh, it's it's going to be a bloodbath out there. So all the conversations that, that we've been having on this call, um, it just got pretty amazing and pretty real in South Africa. Um, and can I just, I mean, to, South Africa is interesting compared certainly to the UK and to um, the US. It's it's a young, you've got a, certainly when I first went to South Africa in the 80s, the restaurant um, business was not nearly as sophisticated as it is today. And you've got a whole lot of very young sommeliers that I've seen there who are just coming through. Um, you travel a lot, Michael, we, we meet all over the place. How would you compare the, the, the picture in terms of the, the on-premise situation there to what you see in other places, also including Asia, where you go to? I think your initial observation is is accurate. Uh, the concept of sommelier is a fairly fresh concept in South Africa. Certainly 10 years ago, there wasn't really that much in the way of a professional sommelier service. Um, the South African sommelier um, institution started probably five or six years ago, but it is going very strong. Um, there is a lot of development, but you know we are definitely behind the world. Uh, and... I think we're accelerating pretty quickly. So, so that's where we are at the moment. But the lockdown is going to change everything in, over the next three weeks. And do you think you're going to see the same kind of home uh, sort of takeaway situation develop there? Can, what, can that happen, do you think? Yeah, there was a lot of um, speculation that the lockdown was going to happen. Um, my uh, Sunday morning running partner is, is actually South Africa's chef of the year for 2020, a guy called Bertus Besson. And during the course of our run, which was not very long, um, he told me that he was closing his fine dining establishment in the short term and converting it into a uh, de home delivery kitchen. That was two days ago. And tonight, actually, I, I was his guinea pig, or one of many guinea pigs. And we had the first home delivery from South Africa's chef of the year. Um, so, yeah, people are going to have to pivot. Uh, I heard Mr. Tidswell say earlier that uh, not everybody's going to be around after this current scenario. So those who pivot and those who pivot quickly are the ones that, could, that are more likely to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I've got a question from um, Eleni uh, Buchu. I'll just see if I'm where I can find you here. I'm, sure I'm sure I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I apologize for that. Eleni, you should, uh, I think, have a microphone in a second if you're there. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where are you? Where are you, Eleni? I'm in Greece. I'm in Greece. And uh, so my name is Eleni Bluhu. I apologize. And, <laughs> well, it's okay. Fine. It's always <laughs> difficult to pronounce my name. Um, so my question was that we are discussing a lot about restaurants and I do understand that uh, this is the core business for the sommeliers. But I know that uh, there exists also private clientele or collectors or people that love wine and purchase wine in other ways. So, um, do they have they changed their purchasing behavior due to the this situation? Do you have an increase in sales on uh, on that side or not? Uh, I was just wondering how this uh, uh, this side works. Well, I put up a small hand on this one. Um, I do have some insight. I've been talking to various merchants. There is going to be. Um, there's going to be disruption in a way to the sort of smarter end of the wine market. I know that a number of wine merchants, in order to generate cash flow, are releasing wines that would normally be re reserved for the on trade. So historically, you know, you would go and take in, and this is normally at the behest of um, the the producers themselves. They would say, look. We know we can sell everything to private clients. What we would like to do, often it matters much more to go and have brand presence, to have it in 67 or in restaurants around, particularly London. In the current market, what's happened is a lot of people have just said, no, we are going to go and release that all out into private clients. So there are a number of collectors who've done very well because they've gone and bought up back vintages of all sorts of interesting bits and pieces. That said, it's not universal. So I spoke to a couple of merchants earlier on today and I said, are you doing this? And they said, no, because at the moment, what we do want to be able to do is, to, you know, when restaurants open back up again, we want them to be able to kind of continue the wine list that they, they had before. So there is a mix. Uh, I know certainly, I think, uh, Jamais, um, that's all gone out into the market. Everything that was held back for Jamais for restaurants has all been released. Uh, and there's a couple of other bits and pieces. I suspect there's probably quite a bit of ridge floating around. Certainly where there's quite a large sort of volumes, but we've seen an element of that um, over the last, you know, few, the last week or so. James, are you aware of anything of that happening in the States? Yes. Hi, Eleni. How are you? Uh, oh. Hi, James. How are you? <laughs> Good. So, yes, we're seeing that. Uh, there are a number of things happening right now in that regard. Uh, you know, I, there, it's such an a trying time for so many people for so many reasons. And one of the things that I think has not been addressed is this idea of almost a sense of, or, or a variation on survivor guilt uh, amongst those who are still employed. The, uh, the off trade in the US is, I've heard numbers like of 25% up over what they would normally be because on trade is doing really well right now. It's hard to talk about that when so many of us are, are friends amongst both the sommelier community and the, on, uh, and the off trade. And that's a very difficult conversation to have. At the same time, we're seeing resources shifted so that people who would have been employed as sommeliers might be going to work shifts at, uh, at uh, you know, retail stores. Uh, the other thing that we've seen is, uh, as Joe pointed out, the release of wines that may not have been for uh, the off trade uh, and would normally be reserved for on trade being released now into that market. And there is a sense by some buyers that I talk to of, of almost guilt or, or feeling ambivalent about this because they're essentially taking what they know would have been their friend's allocation of a wine. And that's a hard, hard thing to accept going back to that idea of collegiality. And so I think there are a lot of tough decisions being made there as well. Uh, at the same time, we are seeing things like an initiative for uh, sommeliers to do the retail buying for collectors. So there's been a push to have, uh, let sommeliers do your shopping for you. And, uh, since many of these are being done either online or call in or, or in some other way, uh, let, let the sommelier pick your wines for you. And there's even an initiative that I heard about in Oklahoma call, called the, uh, I believe it's called the tip jar. And if you're having a bottle of wine at home, you can go to this website and essentially tip a sommelier. And so if you're having a bottle of wine at home, you can make a donation to this fund and it randomly selects sommeliers who have signed up to receive your tip. And so it's a way for the, 
for the consumer to get involved in, in preserving the industry as well. So there Thank are a lot Jane. of different initiatives. Picking up on this, um, I've got a question from Richard Siddle, um, who edits uh, the, the Buyer, which is one of the best online publications. Um, Richard, I don't know if your camera is on, but I've got you up on here. Would you like to ask your question? Richard? Like Richard, I'm going to ask your question for you if, you're, if, I can't, um, if I can't hear you. I'm going to ask it now. Um, Richard's asking, any thoughts on your suppliers, ways in which sommeliers are going to be able to work with so collaborate with suppliers over coming weeks. Fear, um, there's a fear that if your restaurants survive, you'll have fewer, fewer suppliers to work with. So well, that's, um, yeah, go I, on. I, You know, I've seen, um, I mean, talking about allocations earlier, I mean, I think, you know, for us, for me, I think whatever wine merchants have to do to survive through this, then do it. If you've got to sell your restaurant allocations, then, you know, sell it. Um, you know, everyone's got to uh, make a living as much as they can. And these guys, you know, they often work on very, very small margins. They don't have a huge amount of cash flow. Um, a lot of their suppliers, whether they're in France or in Europe or whatever, are kind of saying, okay, nothing's coming out from us. So they've got to use the stocks that they've got to feed the families. So, you know, if they, they're going to sell my allocation of Jamais, fine, I don't care. I, see, I do see a lot of those wine merchants doing quite initiative things. One of the wine merchants in the UK just sent out the other day an email and on it he had six different mixed cases all with quite sort of you know quite interesting names um, and I think that you know what they can do is start getting some sommeliers involved to yeah to do what James was saying earlier to maybe do sommeliers selection of our top favorite his favorite wines from whichever merchant sending those out as mixed cases. I think that that's uh, some really good initiatives from UK merchants. I've got a question from Nicole Rowley um, of Chain Bleu. Um, Nicole, I don't know if your camera's on, but I think you can, you should be able to speak. I think I'm just gonna, you're still muted on your microphones, muted. Nicole, can you hear me? Um, Nicole, are you there? I can't, I can't, no, she's actually disappeared for a second. I can't see her question. There is a, while well, we're waiting for, Oh, hold on. What's that? Somebody else, something. Uh, there we are. Nicole's just come back. Let's we'll see if that's going to work. Maybe not for a second. We're talking about in Italy, where I've got a note from, from Reka Heros saying that there is a problem in, in Italy. Um, she doesn't believe, or, and in fact, Lorenzo Bisconti, um, Italian producers are not, uh, sorry, restaurants, um, can't they can deliver but they can't pick up is is that uh, have i got that correctly oh nicole can hear us but i don't think she can actually speak to us from the moment nicole can you uh, type your question or unless you try and let's see if i'm how much you do again um no i haven't so there you are nicole go ahead great thank you uh, so much i was uh, wondering on the back of uh, james and ronan's uh, comments about the best behavior uh, by people who currently are in a position to do things. I remember after 2009, there was, a, there was some shocking behavior by predatory people who were gloating about the fact that they were going to uh, restaurants and mopping up incredible wines from people's cellars in, in desperate uh, times with uh, making very low bids. Uh, if you hear things like that, uh, do you want to, uh, you know, what's the right way to react? Do you, should those people be disbarred by the profession or you just say, well, it's a free market. Uh, if the price clears, uh, you should just go for it and it's, uh, it's just supply and demand. Uh, how do you feel morally about people doing things like that, which is probably the next step in, in the behavior of some people? I mean, the wine world is a, is a small world, um, especially amongst collectors, and that's not just country to country now, it's globally. So I think that a lot of people that are doing that kind of, that kind of thing, that kind of behavior, I think that people like that get known pretty quickly. And I think whatever small 15 minutes of kudos they get from doing that is, is, it will affect them for a lot longer than their, their 15 minutes of glory. Um, thoughts on that, James, anything? 
Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, as far as uh, to your point about being disbarred by the profession, I'd like to point out that, uh, you know, Ronan is, is in CEO of the Quartermaster Solmays in Europe. And I sat on the board in the Quartermaster Solmays Americas, but the Quartermaster Solmays doesn't regulate the Solmay industry. Uh, that is not its role. And so there, there is, in fact, no regulatory body for soulmates to disbar them from the industry, that is an industry uh, peer pressure uh, action more than anything else. As Ronan talked about with, with collectors, you become known for those types of tactics. And I think at that point, as Ronan pointed out, you will be, you will suffer more in the long term than your 15 minutes of glory. Um, Lara, um, Lara Katana has got a, a quick question, I think you talk, which I think is interesting, particularly for, um, for different countries, but I'm interested to know from the, the, the perspective from the US particularly. Lara, would you um, like to ask that question? You're talking about wine, where wine um, sits in proportion to food, your view from Argentina and elsewhere. Lara, are you there? Lara, I think you should be there. I'll, I'll ask you a question if not. Um, Lara's point was to say that in Argentina considers wine a food, so it's an essential business. Are most other countries considering wine as an essential business? I've seen that in New Zealand. I think it was wine stores were allowed to stay open in the, uh, the lockdown. Is that true, Polly? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, they released that this morning. Um, and it's not only in New Zealand, it's not only the wine stores and our, our groceries, but in fact, we're in the middle of harvest. So for us, it impacted all of our pickers um, and, and how we could manage that. So yeah, we, were, we are a primary industry and we were well cared for in that. But Laura is here. Yeah, Laura. Uh, so in Argentina, you know, wine is food and um, Fortunately, we've been allowed to keep on harvesting and keep on producing wine. Uh, however, we are trying to be very careful to also, uh, you know, keep everybody home in the administrative side who would potentially have the right to be at the winery. Um, because, you know, if uh, somebody gets sick, we have to quarantine everybody. So, so it's, it's kind of a fine balance. Um, and, and I was curious to know if uh, in other countries, wine was also considered food. Um, I see New Zealand is, I imagine uh, from what I've heard in Italy, wineries are allowed to stay open. Um, but somebody told me that recently, no. And in France, does anybody know? I've got a note from Reka Harros, who I'm going to bring in here because Reka is here. Reka, would you like to, to talk to that in terms of, because you're, you're actually running a winery, so um, a small family winery, are you there? Can you hear me? I can, yep. Right, yeah. Um, yes, we are allowed to continue operations because every ag agricultural product related businesses can continue operating but we're you, not you, just to interrupt you're in Prosecco that's correct yeah we're in Veneto in the province of Treviso and uh, but we're not allowed to have anyone come at, for tastings or for visits for any anything like that so all of the work on in the fields can go on and and everything else but we're not allowed to have people do um, we're not allowed to sell it here. We're not allowed to have people come here. We're not allowed to have tastings. We're not allowed to have visitors. There are no visitors. By, by, <laughs> even if we, we could have, there are no tourists. So, Well, that, that kind of makes sense at the, at the moment. But you, you can still, my understanding, we were talking um, last on Friday uh, to Camilla Lunelli, and she was talking about how um, the people from the, the, the Ferrari winery and the Lunelli wineries were able to the, the, the work of vineyard workers are allowed to go to the vineyards, but they have, yes. to, you have to have your piece of paper to say where you're going. And I believe that's true in, in France as well. Yes, it's uh, yes. So workers can come and, and, and work in the fields. Uh, they do have to uh, respect the distance, obviously. And um, every agri agricultural product or drinks product production can continue. So two days ago, we had further restrictions 
but um, we we're safe in that sense. Uh, wine is safe in that sense that we can continue operating. Um, and I think we've got a, a various notes on this, but I think we just slightly keep to our theme of um, actually talking about the the, the, the on trade service. I'm just very aware that we are um, heading right up to the, the our time of closing. We don't we never have to stop on the hour, but we are we're close to that time. Um, thoughts anyone anyone thoughts about where any sort of messages from professional sommeliers on trade people to, to the wider world um rona uh well i mean i think i think the whole world is suffering at the moment so uh every industry is suffering you know um as, as well as hospitality um i you know <laughs> i think that the you know any message maybe not sommelier related but you know the the, I think the message is loud and clear you know we've got to stay um, away from people we've got to stay a um, certain amount of social uh, isolation um, and get through this thing or else there's going to be no industry at the end of it it's going to be a very very messy time if people continue going to parks and doing all that sort of stuff so um you know, I, I think, you know, any kind of industry like the hospitality industry is going to bounce back eventually. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult for a lot of people. Um, but I think, you know, however long it takes, you know, we'll get back there eventually. James, I'm just throwing this into the pot. Do we think that the relationship, some of the relationships that we've established over the years between sommeliers and producers and wineries and, and, and indeed suppliers, do you think there are going to be some fundamental changes in the way that we're all related to each, we all relate to each other? Um, certainly after a period of lockdown, after some financial um, challenges, to put it mildly, do you think that's going to bring in some, some longer term changes? Oh, of course it will. What those changes are, I don't want to speculate, but uh, I think there will be changes. As to how we relate to each other, though, I, I think the relationships will still be there, maybe stronger than ever. That's kind of what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the relationships will be stronger than they were before as to what that looks like for the landscape of, of the restaurant industry and the hospitality profession. I'm not sure. Uh, but you know, in the U S the, the beverage alcohol supply chain, as far as I know, has been uh, deemed an essential business and so remains open. And as that flows through the system, sommeliers are trying their best uh, to remain active in the system, even if their jobs are not available in the traditional sense. And I think it's that sense of perseverance that we all need to hold on to and the idea that take whatever little bit of control of the situation you can. Uh, it's hard. It's very uncertain at the moment, but try to take a little bit of control of the situation if you can do so and find find that little bit and i think those relationships help in that in that respect mm. um do i have rebecca hopkins there do i have rebecca have you got something to to pitch in here i can see your um don't actually see how you are here exactly um uh, while i'm waiting jo joe thoughts you've been talking to um, sommeliers, uh, do you see in terms of an evolution of, of um, relationships? Yeah, I mean, there are certain outcomes. I, mean, I agree, James and Ronan, it's too early to speculate what we're going to see come out the other end. One thing that I would possibly put a fiver on is I think the there has been a general move for certainly for the on trade and for on trade suppliers to become increasingly specialized and to exclusively focus on the on trade that right at the minute whether maybe in the future that's a good idea or not i don't know but i suspect people who have a diverse supply base are the ones who will survive through it best um you know right at the minute talking to various people and you you generally see people who've got a retail arm it's up people who've got a non-trade arm it's completely dead clearly and so if you were a pure on-trade specialist supplier you don't have a long time now to survive at all so we may see that it's more of that hybrid model that comes out of this and and that that will inevitably mean that there's going to be shake-ups of exclusive agencies people trying to find a new home and so on and you know that will will cause a a, a challenge i think that we will see 
you know, when we talked right at the beginning, the collegiate nature of sommeliers and the small world, you know, I've been involved in allocating wines to people. And I can tell you, everybody who, you know, when you do allocate wines, yeah, it's sort of fair, but it's also done on the basis you kind of know people played the game and you know who they are and you say, yeah, I can go and find you an extra couple of cases. And I think anybody who mucks about with the system or tries to take more than their fair share of allocations right now will find that word will get round. And Smellius was, well, you know, he, he was doing this, that and the other. He was profiting off other people's, you know, bad behaviour, of, of, you know, of other people's misfortune. And they won't get allocations in the future. And that collegiate nature, you know, we are in the hospitality industry. People fundamentally are drawn to it because they enjoy looking after each other. They enjoy looking after the interests of other people. And, um, you know, there are some extraordinary good news stories and certainly very heartening stories that I'm picking up of people who are helping out their mates. Yeah, I, I, that's where I see this as being a fascinating uh, and, and obviously horrible, awful time in all sorts of ways. But if, if we can look to, to what's going to um, come out the other side, I do think that the people who are looking at it, uh, A, in an altruistic and in a positive sense, and I think, James, you're talking about employers, the people who are trying their best to, keep, to, 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 to do what they can to keep going and, and, and support their um, employees, but also, as you've just said, uh, Joe, the, the people who are actually working within an industry rather than, than, than trying to, to profit from it will benefit. But I also see, I'm sure, that, that just as... Uh, Ronan has created something very new. James, you created something new in terms of sex, tech song. Um, uh, how many people do the, the conference? How many people come for you? Yeah, about 1,200. And it's a huge event. And the, you know, that's something we don't have any equivalent of anywhere. Ronan, you've done something very different with 67 Pall Mall. We didn't have a, a wine-based place in, in the UK uh, like that in London. Um, and Joe, obviously, with the, with the wine show. I think We've, these are all relatively young initiatives, and I think they're good examples of how we're going to see more changes in the way the wine industry actually uh, is out and facing. And I, I'm, I think I have to feel optimistic within the moment of, of feeling, obviously, not you know, feeling relatively grim as we all are at the moment, but I, I'd like to feel optimistic as to what we can see when we come out the other side. I mean, if we remember in 2007, 2008, after the economic crash then, uh, it, it kind of promoted a lot more of these pop-up restaurants, chefs cooking for eight people at home in their own kitchens, their wives serving in the dining rooms, uh, all these pop-up restaurants that were coming up, pop-up wine bars and things like that. So, and I think that that's, that's a great kind of a, a great initiative and a great um, addition to the industry. And we'll probably see more things like that. Well, can I just say thank you all? We're about seven minutes over. Can I say thank you very, very much, um, the, the, the three of you for, for taking part, Polly, my, my co-host, and everyone who's attended and hung around for the, for the hour. I really appreciate everything you put into it. And, and I think some really good um, insights that have come out of it. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.